Alistair, are you ready to go? Yep. Okay. Alistair, we'll okay. be talking about something that looks awesome. Thanks. Uh, so uh, my name's Alistair De Silva. I'm currently an open source developer at uh, Linux, uh, at the uh, Linux Technology Center at IBM. Uh, just for reference, um, this talk is not representative of IBM. This is purely my own personal thing. Um, so I've been playing around in the hacker makery community for a while. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of the uh, Canva hackerspace um, with uh, Adam and Gus hiding around here somewhere um, and a couple of others. Um, I also have a hobby business called CrankyBot and uh, my wife and I make science-based jewellery with our laser cutter and that's what this talk is all about. So um, I've got a couple of uh, demonstration parts here so I'll just uh, Pass those around. Um, so basically, uh, my wife and I do this just um, to help promote uh, science and critical thinking in the community. This is just our way of um, outreach uh, to the broader, um, the broader community to try and get people thinking a little bit more about um, science and the world around them. Um, so. We sell our stuff at the uh, markets, um, like little boutique kind of stalls and um, we were coming up to the Christmas markets which means that we tend to make a lot of sales which means we need a lot of product. Um, so leading up to that market we were running our machine pretty much all day on a weekend and now these machines are water cooled and uh, this is how they're water cooled. It's a Chinese aquarium pump with a bit of uh, PVC tubing and as it turns out, the adapter that connected the water pump to the tubing was hot glued in place. Now, there's no active cooling of the uh, cooling fluid, uh, water here. Um, and so what happened is over the day as we were running the machine, the temperature crept up and up. And eventually it got warm enough to soften the hot glue and then the adapter popped out of the pump uh, and the laser was running without any cooling and I got back to it just in time to watch the uh, current on the meter drop from 12 milliamps, which is about where it should be, to zero. And that was pretty much the end of that machine, which had a good life. It lived about eight years, so maybe it's time to get a new one. Um, so we thought, well, we're in this kind of a quandary because we need to get product out quickly. So what do we do? We couldn't just order one from China because that was going to take a month to arrive. So these were the machines. Um, it turns out uh, that there's a Chinese vendor who stocks them in Sydney. So we paid our money to the Chinese vendor on eBay and they shipped us one out from Sydney and it arrived at our place within five days, which was awesome because we could get back into making um, our product. Uh, so the only problem is that this is more or less exactly the same machine we originally had. It's the same chassis, same tubing, slightly different power supply, but you know, same water pump and fans and um, wonderful extraction system here, which is basically a hose you dangle out your window. Um, yeah, those fumes, not good, by the way. Um, so they come with this package called Corel Laser which is a plug-in for Corel Draw on Windows, which they nicely provided a pirated copy on the CD with. <laughs> um, now, Corel Laser isn't actually too bad. Um, it does a really good job of raster scanning. Um, it does an okay-ish job of uh, vector cutting, and most of the stuff that we do is vector cutting. But one thing we realise it doesn't do is give you the ability to control the power of the laser when you're doing either of those operations. It basically just runs the laser full bore and then you use that little knob on the control panel to control the power of the laser. Now, a problem that uh, we have is all of our artwork is designed so that our engraving is done with vectors as well. So what that means is when we're doing a single cut in a job, we'll actually be running the laser at different powers, different speeds in order to either engrave or cut. Um, so that means we couldn't actually use the original control system. Uh, this was the uh, board that uh, was in the machine originally. Um, for some reason, even though they give you a pirated copy of CorelDRAW, they protect their software with this little USB dongle that you have to plug into the machine. I don't know. Um, 
So we decided, okay, we'll lift the uh, Linux CNC config from our original machine and drop it on top of there. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Linux CNC is basically a framework of um, applications and controls that let you control a CNC machine, much like uh, John's pick and place machine there, laser cutters, lathes. So you can do, you can control fairly basic machines pretty easily, but it's actually scalable. You can write your own kinematics plugins for it, and you can do things like control five axis CNC machines that have turntables and can rotate the part on different axes. Um, it can control articulated arms. Um, one guy even had a really cool demo where he had a number of cables stringing from across the room into a central point. And each of those cables was tensioned with a motor. And he had a kinematic system so that he could basically control that piece to fly about the room in any position, much like the cameras you would see in a sports match. Um, so it's quite a powerful machine, or a bit of software, I should say. Um, <coughs> It can also do things as well as driving normal stepper motors, it, you can drive servo motors, or you could even drive dumb DC motors as long as you have some other kind of feedback into the system about where your axes are. So, the cheapest way to get hold of these uh, machines and get it converted is to go and start off with your parallel port. Um, most Linux CNC setups on the low end start with a parallel port breakout board similar to these. And the reason for that is that um, the USB controls means that you can't really talk to them with real-time Linux. And um, Linux CNC revolves heavily around uh, real-time components. So basically, oh, sorry, you had a question? Uh, which one? Linux yep. That's a very good question. I'll refer you to the Linux CNC website. Um, when, right. Yeah, I'm not too familiar. It's basically at a lower level than I play with uh, uh, Linux CNC with. Um, basically, when you download Linux CNC from the website, they can. Uh, one of your options is to just either install it straight on top of um, Debian, I think, or it gives you a pre-canned image that you just install on the machine and then you can start hacking with the, um, the <laughs> hardware controls and that's the path that I had gone down. So anyway, basically um, these parallel port breakout boards let you bit bash the lines on the parallel port and let you speak to external devices and read external sensors and bring that back into the Linux CNC environment. Um, you will have another couple of options for control on the cheap side. Uh, there's some FPGA boards made by Mesa, um, which are very cool because they give you lots and lots of control and you can uh, have things like hardware PWM on there so you're not limited to the jitter from real-time Linux um, but instead can run your PWM independently of the, uh, of the kernel in Linux, Linux CNC. Um, another really cool toy that I've got at home but I haven't had a chance to play with yet is a package called Machine Kit which bundles a slightly older version of Linux CNC onto the BeagleBone Black. And the BeagleBone Black has a couple of microcontrollers on board that have access to the GPIO lines which means that when you need to do things like generate steps, you can do that on those microcontrollers and again, you're no longer tied to the real-time constraints of um, the Linux CNC kernel. So one of the things when you're just using a dumb board like this is uh, your step rate. Um, in order to move your, um, your end effector about effect, uh, quickly, you need to get a fast train of pulses coming out from the step lines. And in Linux CNC, that is determined by how frequently you can call the hardware generation modules. And that, in turn, ties down to the amount of jitter in the, um, the real-time Linux uh, components. So there's a few tricks you can do to um, get that jitter down. Um, one of the most effective things that I've found is using a multi-core CPU. And what you can then do is put all your interrupt handling onto your first core, 
and leave the other cores available for the Linux kernel and uh, Linux CNC. Um, there's some information on that on the Linux CNC wiki, so I didn't bother bringing that up here. But basically, that's, um, that's a quick and easy way to get into interfacing one of these machines to your PC. So once you've got data coming out of your machine, you need to be able to get that data into your motors. Um, so the typical way of doing this is with a SEPA driver. Now, this is a more expensive SEPA driver, which I ended up reusing from my old machine. These days, I'd probably just pick up, particularly for a low power machine like a laser cutter, I'd pick up a stepper driver that's made for 3D printers. It's got enough of um, current control there and still does micro-stepping and is ridiculously cheap. You can pick them up for about three or four bucks each as opposed to about 40 for one of those. Um, the really nice thing about these micro-step drivers is that uh, they are effectively doing hardware interpolation of the steps. So where your motor might step from here to here, a half-step driver would be able to do it at 45 degrees, um, then you can go quarter-step and so on. These ones can do up to 256 micro-steps uh, in between each step. Now that's really important when you're laser cutting because what you'll find is if you don't have enough steps, you end up with jaggies which you can't really see, but if you run your hand along the edge of the piece, you can feel it. But um, with 128 and 256 times micro-stepping, you can't actually feel it, so that's not too bad. On my old machine, I was running with 256. On the new one, I'm running with 128. And the reason for that is because I can only generate a certain amount of pulses per second, and I want to be able to seek the head around faster, um, I'm trading off resolution for speed off the uh, head. So basically, these controllers take in two signals. They take in a step signal and a direction signal. Um, so Linux CNC looks at the instructions that are coming in via G-code, um, which is more or less an instruction that says move, this, move to this location. And it figures out when it needs to generate a, a step signal and when it needs to generate a direction signal and those go out through your parallel port, come into one of these and now your motor's moving. Um, so that's not too bad. Um, what... Um, what I've found is that um, once you've got your things moving, you can then go and start uh, talking to Linux CNC about how far it has to move. So what you can do is, if you look at the uh, motor, there's an example of one of the motors up there on the uh, top right. You can count the number of teeth um, on that gear, and you know the pitch of the teeth on the belt, and you know how many micro steps you've got in a revolution because you've set that up on your motor controller and looked at the specs of your motor. So you have a good idea of how much the motor's going to move or your head's going to move when you emit a pulse on the, uh, uh, out of your parallel port. So once you've got that, you, it's, it's not exact, but it's a really good first cut. Um, the only problem that I had with uh, interfacing these things to my machine is that the x-axis motor and the x-axis end stop were on a flex PCB. So I dodged something up here. I basically got a bit off uh, Prado board and soldered some really fine wire wrap wire to each of the traces on this flex PCB. Each of those traces is maybe half a millimetre wide. So it looks kind of messy and it's hard to get light, but you can see the individual traces through there. It's not pretty, but it does work. So I'm sure there's a better way of doing it, but I didn't want to dismember the uh, original control board in case we ever wanted to go back to the original system. Probably not going to happen, though. Once, um, once you've got your motors moving, um, you need to set up end stops on the machine. Well, with Linux CNC, you don't have to, but it's a really good idea to. They basically tell the machine where the limits of each axis are. They're typically either a micro switch or an optocoupler. So if you look in this picture, you've got this uh, little black device here. It's an LED and a photodiode. And what happens is when an axis is at its limit, there's a metal plate that slots in between those and blocks the light between the two components. 
and that allows the uh, photodiode to no longer conduct and uh, means that you can either pull up or pull down your signal depending on what you've got. So once you've got that signal, you can then use your parallel port board, feed that information back into the PC, and now Linux CNC knows where your machine is. So remember I was saying earlier about uh, the steps um, per unit area or unit distance. Um, Due to the fact that you're using belts, the belts can stretch and there's a few other factors at play including backlash. You, um, you may not necessarily get a really good correlation between your calculated um, steps per millimetre and what you've actually done. So you need to uh, work that out for real before you start cutting pieces if you expect them to fit together nicely. So what we did was we commanded the machine to move the head 100 millimetres and fired the laser once at the start and once at the end manually. And then we got out our calipers and measured that distance and that gave us a ratio that we could then stick back into Linux CNC to correct um, the, uh, the uh, step uh, rates. There is another problem though, which is that a lot of these XY and XYZ machines, the axes are supposed to be orthogonal, but they're not there's always going to be a little bit of skew in there. So the next thing that uh, you should do is actually measure this skew. And this is really important because if you're doing something like a PCB or a case, and you cut one side and then you flip it over and you're trying to do something else that mates up with it, you'll find that the holes are no longer actually in quite the right position. And yeah, I found this out when I was doing some PCB work. I was trying to do a double-sided PCB and I flipped it over and suddenly the holes for my through-hole components were off to the side of where the pads were. So it's a bit messy. So what you can do is you cut a square using the same technique as before. So you jog the head 100 millimetres in each dimension, firing the laser at each corner. And then you can just use a little bit of trigonometry to figure out what your angle of skew is. Once you've got that angle of skew, you can plug it back into Linux CNC. Um, and now you can correct, the, uh, correct those offsets. There's a kinematics module in Linux CNC called Milkins. And what that does is it um, provides that translation layer between the logical units that you've got in your G-code and the physical units of the machine itself, uh, which in this case corresponds to the X and Y axes. Okay. Ooh, okay. Um, so the last bit of interface that we had to do was um, getting the laser firing. So what I did was I got a optocoupler and soldered a uh, resistor onto it and shoved the whole lot up in heat shrink. And, um, use that to tie um, one of the outputs from the parallel port back down onto the power supply for the laser. It has active high and active low uh, signals. Um, so the problem with that was that we, um, yeah, when you turn the machine on and Linux CNC doesn't have control of the parallel port, some of those lines go high. <laughs> and my wife uh, meant to use a machine one day and happened to have the laser head parked directly over this wonderful hole that I left in the bottom of the machine for some reason. And so, and she didn't turn the safety switch on the laser off. And so she brought the machine up and she was playing around with um, her images. And in the meantime, the laser was sitting there slowly burning its way through the desk below. <laughs> And not only that, but it managed to drip burning plastic over a cushion that we had below it that was holding the air pump that was driving the um, laser head. Um, so we've got a few things to go for the future. So the first thing is fix that laser state. Um, we definitely want to get raster scan working because um, that's going to allow us a bit more creative options with the machine. We want to add a few more safety features like uh, interlocks uh, on the lid because at the moment you can open the lid and expose yourself to the laser and I have managed to burn myself once with that and that's not great. Um, and adding a few physical controls on the machine like being able to jog the head around without having to go off to the computer beside it will uh, make our life a lot better.
So anyway, that was a uh, brief introduction to how to hack a machine into Linux CNC. Um, hopefully, if you guys want to play with it or uh, um, do your own projects, give us a yell. I'm happy to uh, provide some assistance. So thank you. We only have time for a question or two. Alistair, um, what would you estimate the sort of the budget for upgrading the machine would be in terms of both time and money? Uh, so just converting it to Linux CNC wouldn't be that bad, maybe just a couple of hundred bucks. Um, I did all of that work in a weekend, but that was taking all the knowledge I had already gained from converting the previous machine. Um, there's a lot of stuff I've done to that machine other than the Linux CNC stuff, like upgrading the optics and adding an air assist and a few other bits and pieces, which is further expense, but kind of out of scope, I think, for that particular question. One more question? Yes, Jamie. Um, why Linux CNC over something like Gruble with direct G-code interpretation on the laser? Um, so... Linux CNC, I feel, is a lot more powerful than um, those interpreters. Um, also, they didn't really exist when I first started playing with Linux CNC. Um, so my previous machine I've had for about eight years. Um, and I think there might have been a couple of things around, but yeah, they didn't do... Th yeah, um, so you can do things like constant jerk on... Uh, Linux CNC, and I'm not sure whether you've got enough processing power to do jerk calculations on, um, on there. Someone who's more familiar with, um, with uh, Gerbil and the others can be in a better position to comment on that. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's all we have time for now.